talk today about better leadership, specifically better leadership through psychedelics and how psychedelics can support people like you and me to live into that theme of Creative Morning's theme of acceptance. Both acceptance of others, acceptance of those that we work with and we lead, and also acceptance of ourselves so that we can be better leaders. And as uh, Stephen indicated, a word of warning, this is a talk only, this is not a participatory psychedelic experience. Uh, there was a little bit of a of disappointment last month when Stephen announced the, uh, the subject matter and everyone was like, oh, I'm definitely coming. And then there was a bit of a letdown when they realized that no, there will be no dosing, at least not administered by me anyway today. Um, the, but so let's start with some news. Um, that was the acceptance theme. Let's start with some news. The um, last year, Alberta became the first jurisdiction in Canada to legalize the use of psychedelics and empathogens in a medical situation. And in doing so, they became uh, the first jurisdiction in Canada, but they joined many states in the US that are either exploring or have outright legalized this work. And all across Canada, medical clinics are opening up to allow people to access this therapy in an above ground context. But for decades, this work has been happening underground. And a lot of this current work that these clinics are doing really rests on the shoulders of those in the underground. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this context. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what can happen and what potential there might be for the future. And then we're going to open it up for some Q&As at the end. First, I'm going to start with a little bit of my credentials. So my, let me talk a little bit about my background. My first exposure to psychedelics was when I was 17. And two kids in my boarding school said, let's do, some, let's do some LSD. And as it turned out, they took tabs of paper. And I was the only one on LSD for the rest of the night, which was a lot of fun when you're 16 or 17. And um, it was very eye-opening and very interesting. So when I went away to university, I was experimenting with magic mushrooms. And I was my local dealer in my dormitory and among my circle of friends. But then when I came to Calgary to do my master's degree, I, I, I put childish things behind me. I left all of that alone. And even though I spent the next 20 years of my career as a theater director and playwright and visual artist, I never did any uh, illegal substance stronger than marijuana, which I think is quite ironic, until about 10 years ago when I worked with this gentleman named Dr. Gabor Mate, and I was invited to participate in one of his ayahuasca retreats down in Mexico. So for those of you that don't know, Dr. Gabor Mate is a Canadian author and doctor, and he um, spent many years working in the Vancouver downtown east side with hardcore drug addicts as the resident doctor at the Portland Hotel Society. So working in the poorest postal code with some of the most drug addicted individuals in Canada. And he subsequently wrote a book called In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, Close Encounters with Addiction. I should say too that he's written several books. I think he's written between seven and 10 books. Um, and the In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts is one that has had a major impact on lots of people. And it was largely based on the strength of that work and his, and his addiction work that most recently he was asked to um, do an, a live interview and therapy session with Prince Harry on Facebook. So that's that guy, uh, Gabor. But about uh, 10 years ago, when he was, uh, after he published that book, he had, he had discovered through some circles that if uh, people who have experience with drug addiction uh, are, uh, use ayahuasca in, a, like in, in, in as little as less than a week-long ceremony, they can have profound impact on their ability to kick their hardcore opiate drug use habit. And this journey of his discovery is outlined in a film called Jungle Medicine that was on CBC's Nature of Things about 10 years ago. So still, it's on the internet for free now if you're interested in following on that. So about that same time, um, my wife and I, oh, I'm so sorry, these slides are moving automatically, so I'm just going to have to keep an eye on those and stop them from doing that. Um, so about 10 years ago, my wife and I, um, uh, my wife approached Dr. Gabor Mate and said, I'd um, like to do a play with you. 
And surprisingly, he said yes. I don't know how she convinced him. But so she, we ended up doing a play. I was the director, and she was the, uh, she was the co-author and um, co-actor with Gabor on stage. And we really got to know Gabor at that point. And one of the things he said before we started was, if we're going to be working together, we should do ayahuasca together. So come down to this retreat that I'm leading down in Mexico. And while I was down there, it was my first exposure to ayahuasca, and it was also an opportunity when I was able to watch and learn uh, um, how it would, could be used in a therapeutic context. For instance, my roommate, one of my roommates, kicked a 12-year cocaine habit in that week after taking only two out of the three ceremonies. By the time I got to the third ceremony, he said, I think I'm good, I'm done. And I kept in touch with him for a couple of years afterwards, and he never did return to using cocaine. Um, so I, uh, and after that, after we did that play, my wife embarked on a career where she redesigned her therapy practice to really focus on psychedelic medicine. So for the past decade, she's been um, uh, one of the city's leading underground psychedelic therapists. And since then, she's launched her training program, and she now runs a podcast called Punk Therapy which is about psychedelic therapy. In the meantime, I left the arts world and the theater world and embarked on a career as a corporate facilitator. I do strategic planning. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching for both corporations and nonprofits. My clients include the Calgary Stampede, the United Way, the Drop-In Center on the nonprofit side and the Jazz YYC Foundation. And on the for-profit side, Volker Stevin Construction, RWI Engineering, Lynx Energy, and Brookwright Homes, uh, Brookwright Developments. I'm often a guest speaker at places like Tech Canada, McKay CEO Forums, um, the Association of, Engine of Petroleum Engineers and Geophysicists of Alberta, and Chartered Professionals in Human Resources, a whole bunch of different organizations. So I have feet in, in all sorts of different worlds, in the psychedelic world, in the arts world, and in the corporate world. And because my wife is a psychedelic therapist, I'm also occasionally called upon to act as an assistant in her, in her, um, in her psychedelic sessions. Stephen, I'm sorry, the slides aren't advancing for me, so I'm just going to let you take a look at it, and if that fails, then I'm just gonna continue to talk. Um, well, there we go, one of them is advanced. Oh, okay, I can do that. Yeah, I'll do it that way. That's great, perfect, perfect. Thanks so much for showing me that, I appreciate that. Thank you for your patience, everybody. Um, so I was saying that I've occasionally been called upon to act as a psychedelic therapist. Um, and, the, and in doing so, I've learned a lot. Um, I was a, I've often been asked because my wife's, my wife's therapy room is in our house. So people would come into the house, I would be grabbing a coffee or water in the fridge, I'd get a chance to interact with one or two, a couple of clients, and then you know, they'd go on and do their session. And as they progressed through the therapy, and they would often, um, they would get to the point where they were gonna be embarking on a medicine session, which consists of three days. So they will meet um, the afternoon of, the, of day one to set their intention. They'll do a full day under medicine the next day. Um, but that's a long day for uh, my wife to be working with one person, so she'll often have an assistant. And then there's a second day of integration afterwards. These individuals would sometimes ask me to be their assistant, and I was always quite honored when they would ask, because often they're asking because they need to have a safe male presence in the room. Either somebody who can stand in as a father figure, someone who can stand in as just as a male presence, and sometimes, in the most, when I feel most honored, and when they have experienced past sexual trauma and they want to have a male presence in the room that they can feel safe with, but also that they can ask to leave the room and be in control of where that male presence is and how close it is to them. So that was always, I always felt very honored when I was, had that opportunity, and I also came to realize I better take some training in this field so I don't cause any damage to these poor people. So I started taking my, when my wife launched her training program, I took that training program. And in the process of doing that, I began to see how I could merge these two worlds together. So I'm going to walk you through a little bit of what those worlds look like and how, they, how they're shaped, and then I'm going to talk about how I think they can all be kind of merged together. So I'm going to go to this little picture here, and because I think there's really three different ways of approaching psychedelic medicine that I want to talk about. There's a uh, spiritual or shamanic approach. There's a more clinical or therapeutic approach. And then there's um, a leadership embodiment approach that I kind of want to talk about, represented here. And like any good Venn diagram, they all kind of overlap with one another. 
And it really also helps to break them out into separate pieces. So let's talk about them one at a time. So let's talk a little bit about the spiritual slash shamanic approach. So this is what most people think of in terms of psychedelics. When they think about psychedelics being used in any context other than partying on the weekend, in your university days, in your high school days. So this is the context in which you can travel to Costa Rica or Portugal or Brazil or Mexico or Peru or California and you can sit with someone who will provide you and serve you mushrooms or ayahuasca. The session is usually led by a shaman and you can do three or four sits over the course of a week or over the course of 10 days and then you can return home. And if you're smart, you'll make sure you've got a supportive community that you can return home to but that's not necessarily part of the program. And these kinds of experiences, like all the ones I'm gonna talk about, exist on a continuum. And you can find the, uh, over here on the left side, the true spiritual experience led by the shaman who is steeped in the traditions of the medicine. The shaman has likely spent years or even decades in an apprenticeship to an indigenous elder and has deep respect for those traditions. It doesn't have to happen in an exotic location. It doesn't have to happen down in any of those countries I mentioned. You can find these kinds of ceremonies right here in Alberta. And in those kinds of ceremonies, they'll often try to replicate that ceremonial setting. You'll leave the city to go out into nature quite often. And even though you may not be out in an open air um, uh, a clearing out in the jungle, they'll, do, they'll make every effort to try to replicate some of that with soft tapestries and hangings and candles and um, carvings from that tradition. Over here on this end, we can find also some ceremonial uh, spiritual quests that are really stripped of, that, of, the, of the tradition, stripped of that context. You know, you might find this at a, uh, you know, might go, go to like um, uh, a camp or a ranch where you can, um, instead of a shaman, you'll find a facilitator. The session might begin with a prayer, but it's more of an homage to the roots than it is as an actual calling forth of the spirits to guide you. Maybe you'll be even in a basement rather than out in nature. And even though it's more secular, I'm still grouping these two things together because even though it's more secular, it's still the focus is on an inner awakening. Usually in both of these contexts, you'll find that the medicine is in its organic form. So there's like ayahuasca that you're drinking from a glass that's brewed from the plants, or you're actually eating the actual mushrooms, the actual, psilocy, the actual magic mushroom stem, right? So there's some pros and some cons of this. Here's some of the drawbacks is that it's not for everyone. You have to be open to a certain amount of woo-woo to be up for this kind of thing, and that's not for everybody, right? Um, there's also a lack of integration. What tends to happen after these sessions, as I mentioned, you leave, these, the, you, know, you leave your retreat from Peru or wherever you are, and then you come back to, uh, to the city, come back to your life, and what tends to happen is that people revert to baseline quite quickly as the real world intrudes, as their old triggers begin to resurface. Um, so you might, so this is why I say it's important to make sure you have a supportive community to, to return to. But one of the other things that happens is a kind of a negation of the experience. It often happens that people will say they'll have this breakthrough or a big paradigm shift, and then they'll often say afterwards, well, I was just on drugs. That was just the drugs talking, right? Um, so, and that's often a clue too, by the way, is that often you can find a real switch in mentality as people embark on this journey when they stop talking about drugs and start talking about medicine. That's often a real clue as to where people are on that journey. Um, let's move on to that second circle. So let's talk about the medical slash therapeutic context. Again, these things exist on a continuum. So on the left, there's the kind of the above ground clinical world that's beginning to emerge with this new legalization. And then there's also on the other end, the kind of the more underground community-based background. So the, um, on, the, on the left here, let's talk about that clinical setting. Clean professional atmosphere, staffed by professional medical personnel. You know, there might be a doctor on staff, there'll certainly be a nurse practitioner on staff. There's a long intake process 
lots of interviews, uh, lots of consultations with either the doctor or the nurse to ensure that you have no contraindications. You will need a referral from a doctor or a psychologist to even begin this process. The selection of medicine that you will take is, um, can be quite limited, can be heavily controlled, and the manner in which you take it is quite heavily regulated. And you might not be interacting with the clinician very much. You might get an injection, be asked to put on your blindfolds, and then you'll be there by yourself. They might hold your hand. They might be asked to help you through it, uh, if you ask. And you'll often be taking three or four sessions in a week, which might in, or in a, in a process of weeks, which might include one-to-one um, -one meetings as you evaluate your progress. At the other end of the spectrum is this kind of underground community. And at this end, usually in somebody's home, uh, there might be more of those ceremonial trappings that I mentioned, like the carvings and the tapestries and things like that, rather than at the clinical setting. Um, and there's often a less formal intake process. That's not to say it's any less rigorous, it's just that it's less formal and that there'll be more flexibility in, well, you know, this is a bit of a contraindication, so let's take it easy. Let's start, let's, let's do the dose a little bit, uh, a little bit more gently. Let's introduce a smaller dose first and see what happens, which is not gonna, very unlikely to happen, I should say, in a clinical setting. Um, and there's also, but because it's below ground and exists in that gray area, there's a much wider variety of medicines that you can take other than what's legal. Like in Alberta, ketamine is legal at the moment and everything else is under a trial condition. So if you're going into an underground setting, you can have access to more of those substances. Um, the facilitator is likely to be uh, very well trained in, um, through a number of underground programs that have popped up over the past decade. And in fact, they actually might be more experienced with psychedelic therapy than in a clinical setting. Because doctors and nurses in a clinical setting, it's often illegal for them to work with a lot of substances up until very recently. Whereas in an underground setting, you could be working with someone who has decades of experience with this medicine. Um, my impression is that in, the, in this end of the spectrum, the interaction you have with the therapist is much more interactive. Whereas the therapist is talking to you, talking with you, um, taking you through exercises, taking you through visualizations, rather than simply, here's your blindfold, here's your medicine, off you go. And the medicines that we're using in this context are often synthesized. So you're looking at MDMA, 3-MMC. Um, uh, MDMA, by the way, is the active ingredient in ecstasy, but without the speed that makes ecstasy um, the party drug that it is. Um, other medicines include 4-ACO or 5-MeO-DMT or ketamine can all be things that you might be finding as synthesized medicines in this context. So in my experience, as I do, as I've been moving through this, I've been experiencing, and as I've been going through my training, I've been observing just how PTSD or treatment-resistant depression can work and be, uh, how it can work with these medicines. In traditional talk therapy, someone can understand that they're out of danger, that this traumatic event is in the past. And they can understand that up here in their head. But the knowledge stops there. And their nervous system remains on guard. So you can tell somebody that, that, that there's no danger out there in the world, that an explosion is not going to happen, or that a car accident is not going to happen at any moment. And, yet, and they can understand that up here. And yet at another level, at a body level, their body and their nervous system remains on guard and remains in a state of hypervigilance. And as you can imagine, this constant state of hypervigilance can remain, uh, can really be wearing on, the, on a person's health, right? And also, we talk about the, this medicine work in terms of PTSD a lot, but there are many other forms of trauma, sexual abuse, and there's all sorts of other forms of trauma that someone can go through. But there's also attachment disorder issues. And those are things that can happen to each and every one of us. So many of us may have had loving, wonderful parents who really tried their best and were there for them all the time, such as I had. And yet, no parent can be there 100% of the time for every child. And so all of us have grown up with some degree of separation anxiety from our parents, and we adapt to that when we're three, when we're four, when we're five, when we're 15, when we're 25, when we're 35, when we're 55. And so those attachment uh, ways in which we program our brain can often work for us for a long period of time, but then when we're 30, 40, 50, they can start to come back to bite us in the, in the rear end.
And it's often really helpful to clear those. And again, just like with talk therapy, I can understand that my parents loved me up here, but something else is happening in the nervous system that leaves me perpetually on guard in my relationships. And I'll talk in just a moment about how that's manifested in my own life. But first, I wanna just talk briefly about, about oops, sorry, I was gonna do the summary thing. Um, I think with this work in the clinical setting, there's often better integration because that's built into the program. So you'll have a one-on-one -on -one follow up with your therapist in a clinical setting or in an underground setting. Hopefully you'll even have an ongoing relationship with that underground therapist. Not always, and if that's not the case, then you should seek it and try to, try to find it. In a clinical setting, you might be working in the clinic, but then you might return to regular therapy with your regular therapist or doctor. I wanna talk this, about this stuff though. This is the embodiment leadership piece, and this is the stuff that I'm really fascinated by because of my background as a corporate facilitator and working with corporations and nonprofits. And again, all of this is kind of on a spectrum. We have leaders who use psychedelics to transform their thinking. Steve Jobs famously uh, used LSD in college and perhaps for much longer in order to uh, develop and expand his thinking about what was possible with computers and computing. Um, and there's lots of other people, uh, Tim Ferriss is another person who talks about the impact of psychedelics in his business life and in, in, in his leadership roles. Um, and when we think about how this could manifest in the workplace, it, some of you might get nervous about thinking about working with somebody who has been using psychedelics. And I'm here to tell you that you might be right to be worried about that, but that it's also not as frightening as many people think. For instance, I'm on LSD right now. About an hour and a half ago, I ingested a microdose of LSD, because microdosing is something that many people have, around the world have been doing. It started in kind of Silicon Valley, and pe where people found that by taking um, tiny amounts of uh, of either psilocybin or of LSD, pretty much sub-perceptual levels. So that's about one-tenth of what you might think of as a trip dose. This will help them, they feel, with everyday focus, productivity, creativity, mood, cognition, memory, self-awareness, depression, a whole host of different things. Depends on what the person's after in terms of what they're using uh, microdosing for. Um, I tend to use microdosing for focus and productivity. So my first experience with it was when my wife and I were like, well, let's just try this thing that everybody's talking about. So we didn't want to do it in a, any kind of work context where anything was dangerous, so we went to the cabin. We you know, had breakfast and then we like kind of gonna sit down and do some work and I was gonna work on my book, she was gonna work on hers and so we took a little, uh, little kind of microdose of LSD and then at around like four o'clock I said to my wife, I'm like, I don't really think, I don't feel anything, I don't think it's working. And she said, yeah, I don't really feel anything either but on the other hand, you just spent six hours solid without a break working on your book. So it's subperceptual, you don't really notice its effect and it has its kind of underground effect in increasing productivity, increasing focus, but also, as many people have said, with, um, with depression. So if there's been lots of uh, books out there recently with um, people, uh, and a lot of them have been written by women, who have been battling chronic depression and find that by taking some form of microdosing, whether it's psilocybin or LSD, really helps them manage their mood and really helps them in a way that drugs don't and without, without most of those negative side effects that come with drugs. They're not addictive, they, are, um, they, they, they don't have any of the physical side effects of, um, of being hard on your, on your immune system. And so what, what I'm really interested in is moving beyond um, psychedelics, sorry, moving with psychedelics beyond microdosing and into uh, a, a different kind of context. I want to know what happens if we can bring psychedelics into a larger leadership context to improve the way that leaders show up in the workplace so that we end up with more embodied leaders. I mentioned that I did a lot of speaking engagements with groups such as Tech Canada and CEO, uh, McKay CEO forums. So these are mastermind groups where individuals, largely CEOs or other C-suite executives who run corporations can get together in a safe space 
So Tech Canada, which is the group based out of here in Calgary, but with chapters all across Canada, um, is the group that I mostly would be a guest speaker with. And I would go all across Canada to these different cities, and I would find these little kinds of pods or cells of individuals who of business leaders who each run different companies. And in one room, there would be somebody who runs a taxi company, somebody who runs a construction company, somebody who runs a design company, all of them from different industries. But they're all there to provide a safe, psychologically safe space, a confidential space for people to talk about the problems they're facing in the workplace. Because if you run an organization, you can't talk to the other people that you work with about what the problems you're having with the people that you work with, because you're the boss. So unfortunately, a lot of people who are in that position have nobody that they can talk to except other leaders, and there's no real formal process for that. So groups like Tech Canada and McKay CEO forums are really helpful in this regard. And I really liked watching how these groups were supporting one another. And I began to wonder what happens if we were able to inject uh, psychedelics into that context. So I'm looking at what happens if you can um, put together a cohort of business leaders over the course of four or six months who can meet monthly and at about the halfway mark, in, so you can build trust over the course of several months. But then instead of having a retreat down in Las Vegas or New Orleans, what if we do the retreat right here in Calgary where we follow the same psychedelic medicine protocol? Set your intention on Friday night to figure out, when you've already spent months together identifying what it is that's holding you back as a leader, and then spend Saturday under the medicine really understanding how that can have an impact on your nervous system so that you can really embody the change that you, that you see in the world, and then spending Sunday morning really kind of talking about and integrating that with your, with your left brain, moving from the right brain into the left brain. But I also don't want it to end there. I want to make sure that we have the integration support over the next coming months so that we don't revert to baseline, so that these leaders, once they've, ha once they've had this big paradigm shift, can capture and retain what they've learned and really challenge themselves and support one another about how they can integrate that into their work moving forward. So let me give you an example of how I think this might work, because I'm really thinking that the the real power of this is at the intersection of these three circles. Because I think it's about more than just leadership. You can't really talk about how you show up as a leader without understanding and embodying who you are from a, kind of a, from a felt sense. And here I'm gonna avoid the woo-woo words like spirituality, but without really embodying who you are and what your purpose is on this earth. And I think it also intersects with that therapeutic background in terms of what's holding you back and what's always been holding you back as a leader. And let me give you an example of how this kind of has, has played out in my life. So I came across a great phrase by an author named Gay Hendricks called the upper limit problem. He believes that each of us has some sort of upper limit that is holding us back. You can be incredibly successful in the work that you do as a community leader, as a business leader, or um, just in the way that you show up in the world, but many of us know that there's some indefinable thing that's preventing us from reaching the, the zone of, of true abundance. We can be excellent at our job, but there's something that's holding us back from our zone of genius, as he calls it. So for me, my upper limit problem is my outsider syndrome. I mentioned that I spent the first 20, 25 years of my career as a playwright and theater director before shifting into corporate facilitation and coaching business people. So I have that real sense of like, I don't have an MBA. I don't have that background. I have, I've run arts organizations, but I haven't run corporations or a business. So I often can feel like a bit of an imposter in those situations. And people can tell me that, oh, your outsider status, your outsider view is really helpful to us. And it really, it, you're able to take a, a different perspective on our work and we really value that. And I can understand that up here, but I don't understand that at a nervous system level. I still feel like an outsider. I was on this retreat with Dr. Gabor Mate. He said, well, is this the first time you've ever felt like an outsider? I thought about that question. I thought, well, no, actually. Probably not the first time I felt like an outsider. If I trace all the way back, I'll go back to my high school years, and my parents sent me away from the farm 
and they saved up all their pennies, and they sent me to an elite boarding school north of Toronto. And there's nothing that's going to make you feel like an outsider than being a farm kid amongst a bunch of rich kids. So I was really hardwired, it was really programmed into my sensibility that I don't belong in this world that I've found myself. I get to university and start taking a theater degree and that changes, but there's still part of me that doesn't believe that change. So Gabor asks me, is that the first time that you've ever felt like an outsider? And I think about it a little bit more and I think, well, no, actually, because I was a farm kid. I grew up on a farm but I never really felt like I belonged on the farm. So um, here's, here's, uh, here's my dad uh, from 1955, uh, from the, you know, at the Wallacetown Fair, happily showing off his, uh, his cow. And uh, here's me, not so much enjoying the farm. So even as, so as an artistic soul growing up on the farm, I really did not feel as if I was in the right place. I didn't feel as if I belonged. My father, uh, was you know, uh, president of the Lions Club and they raised funds for the local swimming pool and the local baseball park and the local soccer fields. And his son wasn't interested in any of that. He tried to teach his son how to play baseball. His son wasn't in, was very uncoordinated, was not very athletic. So here you've got a father who doesn't know how to relate to a, to a five-year-old boy. And what happens to the five-year-old boy who can't be related to, who doesn't feel as if his father understands him? What happens to that little boy who doesn't feel as if he belongs, who doesn't feel accepted? So th the lessons that that boy learns uh, are imprinted on that child. And that's what manifests itself in those elite Toronto boarding school, that manifests itself in the um, university days, that manifests itself in the um, corporate world later. But this is even more embedded than that. My mother, I was talking about this just, just yesterday. My mother was, uh, in the 1970s, was an early feminist. She was a school teacher. And uh, there was no way that she was not going to go back to teaching after she had her second child, which was me. So she, um, uh, about a year after I was born, she um, uh, struck up an arrangement with a woman down the road who had also had a baby that was exactly the same age. And every morning from the time I was one year old, she would drop me off with a stranger, and she would go off and teach school and then when she would come back about eight hours later and pick me up. So what happens to the infant that doesn't understand why it is being separated from the mother every single day, day after day, from the age of one until five? I remember only one thing from that period. I remember my mother coming to pick me up from the farm and me crying uncontrollably and fighting tooth and nail because I didn't want to leave because I'd just been comfortable there. And then I remember her dropping me off every morning and me crying and fighting tooth and nail because I didn't want to be left. So we find there the true roots of the leader who feels like an outsider. And this leader can understand that here but he's not going to sink in in that nervous system level unless you do something radical to get at that. You can tell me that I belong here on this stage, and I get that in my head, but I don't get that in my body. And that's where uh, psychedelic medicine can come in. Imagine if you're in a ceremony with some leaders that you've just spent two or three months building, uh, building a bond with, building trust with. They understand your issues, you understand their issues. You've really kind of talked about this over the course of multiple sessions and over the course of multiple one-on-ones with me, your facilitator. Now imagine you're in this session. Imagine you're me, you've got these outsider issues. What would happen if the facilitator was able to say, let's get one of the other members of your trusted cohort to stand in as your father. You're under medicine. You're using MDMA, which is an empathogen, which is a heart opener. So already you have more empathy towards yourself, and you have more empathy towards the other members of your cohort, but you also have more empathy towards your father. And now we've just asked somebody to stand in as your father. And we're gonna do a little bit of a role play. We're gonna ask this father to tell you that you are loved and accepted for who you are. Not for what you do, not for what you say, but simply for who you are. 
And this person who you've built a rapport and a trust with is going to look you in the eyes as they say that. And they might even just stay there silently and hold that space and hold that eye contact for as long as you need. And when we're finished with that exercise, we're going to switch. And you're going to stand in as your father. And you're going to have the opportunity to say to yourself what you wish your father had always been able to say to you. And then we'll switch again. And we'll let you have the opportunity to repeat back to your father what you always wish you could have said to your father. Imagine how, under the influence of medicine, that experience can sink into and really inform your nervous system and your subconscious. And now imagine that you've got another two or three months with your cohort afterwards. So you can talk about how that change is manifesting in your workplace, how you're showing up with more empathy with those that you work with, how you're showing up with more empathy for yourself, how you're more patient with your family, how you're more patient with yourself and the own er your own errors that you may make. And we'll build a plan for how you want to show up for the rest of your work life as a leader. And we'll get your colleagues to hold you accountable for how you plan to show up. And then if you wish, we can start another cohort all over again and you can explore a different issue if you wish. But you'll have had the opportunity to develop a question, investigate that question, and really experience a change. And you'll have the opportunity to, to, to build an accountability plan to, to really put that change into action. And that is the potential power of psychedelic leadership. Learning to be able to say to yourself and to be able to accept yourself that you belong here now as a leader in whatever way that shows up in you, in your career, and in your life. And that is the power of psychedelic leadership. Thank you. <laughs>